It is challenging to put our deepest thoughts, emotions and desires into words. Language can only go so far, and yet we have no other option but to use it in order to convey what is written on our hearts. Human ability to communicate has its limits, and this is even true for conscious thought and rational discourse. That is where the famous quote by Ludwig Wittgenstein entered the stage, where of one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. But we try it anyway, we must in a sense, otherwise we cannot make progress in one of our core pursuits, which is talking about our quest for real and deep meaning. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle conceived humans to be rational animals. No other creature has the capacity to use its intellect and find answers to questions the way we can. Therefore, the Greek art philosopher declared that we are here to make use of our rational minds and to seek after reason and truth. When we become intellectual truth seekers, we are living in our purpose. Thomas Aquinas, a philosopher and theologian in the 13th century AD, followed in his footsteps. His most prized book is the ominous Summa Theologica, which spans over 61 volumes. You must be quite the writer to do all of this by hand, and I could imagine that his dominant hand looked like the Incredible Hulk after a life full of writing. His idea of the beatific vision was that we are never truly fulfilled until all of our longings are stilled. Since to him we are more than just material beings, material things in this world can never fully satisfy our souls. In the end, we can only be fulfilled if we achieve communion with the eternal God who knows no end. Only if we merge with this infinity can we find everlasting happiness, which is what we have always been destined to do. Fast forward a few hundred years, almost to the Renaissance in the 18th century, there we find the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. He founded a philosophical school called Criticism, also known as Critical Rationalism. In his book, The Critique of Practical Reason, he states that the ultimate end of human endeavor is perfect moral virtue, coupled with complete happiness. Now, the former stands out as the condition to be deserving of the latter. Sadly, he concluded that while moral virtues should be the benchmark to measure who deserves happiness, one thing does not logically ensure the other, which to him means that we need God as a moral postulate to connect the two presuppositions. Philosophically speaking, there are two traditions that both have a very different approach in how things like the world, reality, truth and purpose have to be perceived. One of them is called rationalism, whereas the other is referred to as empiricism. People like Immanuel Kant or René Descartes were rationalists and they held that only reason can guide us to truth and meaning. After all, our observations are always fallible and subjective, which is not true for logical deductions, right? On the other side of the spectrum, we find empiricists, with philosophers like David Hume and John Locke. And they would utterly disagree with the rationalists. The only thing that can guide us to an understanding about reality and purpose, they would say, is that which we can analyze and observe by means of our measurements and our senses. Now, when it comes to the quest for our meaning, we need to bear in mind that there is a long tradition of discourse, because of course we are not the first to ask such questions. The discussion generally comes along under the headings of teleology, which is the study of meaning, since telos is the Greek word for meaning, and logos can be translated as word, study, or logic. When we talk about teleology, we often find that two opposing worldviews are present. They are termed realism and constructionism. The realist says, I want to find my purpose out there. Where do I find it? And the constructivist says, we are responsible for our purpose ourselves. How can we create it for individuals and societies? 
This means that realists believe that meaning is something we need to discover, whereas constructivists think that it is something that needs to be created. In consequence, the chances are high that a realist really wants to find the true and consistent meaning of our life, while the constructivist contends that at best we can find satisfactory meaning in life. When we go way back, even long before Aristotle, and head to the Middle East, we find an ancient religion that still exists today, Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrians came from ancient Persia. Their ideas go back to the prophet Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra, who introduced a deity of wisdom called Ahura Mazda. He is the only and supreme god, and Gramainu is his devilish adversary, who in the end will be destroyed. The Zoroastrian purpose for human life is that we are here to seek the true and good path of God, because it leads us to wisdom and virtuous actions. Since God provides us with free will, we are responsible for our choices, and by acting accordingly, we have a place in the cosmic conflict between good and evil, which in effect is a battlefield for the salvation of our souls. By following the correct path, we help to spread happiness and defeat chaos. If we head east even more, we find Hinduism, which is perhaps one of the oldest religions still being practiced. Hindus believe that we are incarcerated in an endless cycle of life and death, known as samsara. The goal is to use various methods in order to finally get out of this cycle. This is the Hindu purpose for us to jump out of this cycle and to get united with Brahman, the supreme Hindu god. This is called moksha, meaning liberation, and it occurs via a rich panoply of states and practices that often also involve dealing with some lower gods. Out of this tradition came Siddhartha Gautama, who is generally regarded as the founder of Buddhism. The goal now is not so much to deal with the gods, but to exit the world of suffering through the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths. A very different picture is drawn by Judaism, a religion not terribly interested in individual salvation, but in the communal aspects of life, either between humans or between the person and God. Abiding by the mitzvot, the divine laws, and studying the Torah, the divine books delivered by Moses, can provide this required closeness to God. The teachings appeal to the pursuit of hard work, humility, education, peace, justice and compassion, among other things. Humans were created with the destiny to be in connection with the Almighty. In other words, humans are here to honor God and to follow Him as His people. And, you know, as the story goes, the Hebrew people were selected to stand out as a role model for these ideals. Now, Christianity heavily builds upon this conception, although it sets out to shift the focus back from the collective society to the individual. Christians believe that humans were created in the image of God, also called Imago Dei, and were made to be with Him. The scripture holds that humans have rebelled against God's decrees and have fallen short of His glory, whereby they were cast out of a paradisiac existence. Jesus gave His life to make things right again and to reunite people with God. The meaning of life, according to Christian doctrine, is to love God and to love your neighbor. All moral virtues basically follow from these two principles. Although Islam also adheres to the idea of a personified God, this version of a deity is much less personal. And with less personal, I mean that humans are not to seek deep community and relationship with Him as His children, but rather as His servants. Islam literally means submission, and the key paradigm for believers is to obey and subdue to the path of Allah. So, the central meaning to human life for Muslims is to submit and obey to the one and only God by abiding by the laws handed down by Muhammad, his prophet. 
In the 20th century, classic philosophical and religious ideas have altogether been rejected by new protagonists on the screen, the French existentialists. We find among them the famous Jean-Paul Sartre, his lover Simon de Beauvoir, and his sparring partner Albert Camus. Existentialism was a culture, a movement, a system, a style, and a philosophy, if you like. Imagine yourself sitting in a cafe in Paris after the Second World War, smoking a cigar, wearing black and gray clothes, and discussing with your educated friends your newly found idea that there is, in fact, nothing outside of ourselves that we can be certain of. There is no truth outside of our own existence. There is no purpose we don't make up ourselves. You discover that life and everything in the universe is absurd. Objectively, nothing makes any sense. Our existence precedes our essence, and although death is inevitable, it is what gives us purpose. What makes existentialists so unique, and to my mind so amazingly sympathetic, is that they take the question and the problem of the meaning of life so drop-dead seriously. They are definitely not joking about it. They know that we need some purpose. Otherwise, we cannot and do not want to survive. They are troubled by the fact that it seems so slippery and that it is so hard to get a steadfast answer that can outlast the fire of the flames that are our burning questions. Existentialists believe that when we are born into this world, all we have is our existence. There is nothing else we have. This is an interesting idea, and many today have been strongly influenced by it. Especially the ones who claim that there is no objective meaning to our existence. There is just one tiny problem. I think they are mistaken. Existentialism is wrong. Now, we don't have the time here to get into all of the details. So, if you are interested in digging a little deeper, getting to know more of the classic ideas around human purpose, learning about existentialism and why it has been heavily criticized, feel free to have a look at my book, Discovering the Meaning of Life. Now, in order to better understand how we could have a feasible discussion about objective meaning, we first need to understand how such ideas are properly deconstructed. For this, we need to learn more about what is called the critical method of transcendation. But this will be the topic of our next episode. Until then, stay curious.